church, I'm so excited to be back with you tonight for another study in God's Word. And we're going to do another lesson out of Isaiah. Um, and uh, I think it'll be an encouragement to your hearts. And, and uh, man, I wish we were together. I, I so love uh, having started to get to know you all and, and being a part of your life. And man, I'm looking forward to, to being there soon. Um, tonight, let's open our Bibles, if you have them, I hope you do, to Isaiah chapter number 65. And tonight we're going to talk about hope, and we're going to talk about hope that comes from the future. You know, there's all kinds of things that can steal our hope. Uh, if you're not careful, uh, the news <laughs> can very quickly uh, steal your hope. It can give you a kind of a down outlook. Um, if you want to have a loss of hope, pay attention to the news. Pay attention to politicians, right? Um there can even be a sense in which if you pay really close attention to the stock market, you can lose hope pretty quickly. Um, those of you who have friends on social media, you can lose a lot of hope. And maybe this is even a reason why you would even listen tonight. Maybe this is what God has for you tonight to get you to stop doing this. But if you're comparing the totality of your life to the highlights of other people's lives on, on social media, like the best... It's really their greatest hits. They're only going to put the best things out there, right? And if you're comparing your entire life to the best of, of what's going on in somebody else's life, you're going to lose hope pretty quickly that you may not have the kind of life that you feel like you deserve, right? I could, You could fill in the, the, the blank on all, all kinds of things that would steal hope in your life or cause you to lose hope. And it's probably not even good to even try to build that list because for most people, those things are top of mind anyway, right? Um in our future, if our future focus is not including what God tells us what will happen in the future for those of us who know him as Savior, we can lose hope pretty quickly. We'll, we'll inevitably not be with, without a lot of hope because the truth of the matter is that is where our hope should be. Conversely, when we understand what God has planned as he has revealed it to us in his word, we'll have all kinds of hope. <laughs> Jesus said it this way, let your, not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. It's so cool. God sent Jesus to redeem us from our sins. And if we know Christ as Savior, the Bible says that he's gone away to prepare a place for us. And because of this reality, we have an incredible future ahead of us. Those who trust in him have an incredible future. And that's why I want us to look at Isaiah chapter 65 today. Uh, in verses 17 through 24 is what we're going to study. It's the really the end of that chapter. And I want our future focus to be hopeful by seeing what God has planned for us. Now, to give you some context of Isaiah chapter number 65, this text speaks clearly of the future kingdom of God. It speaks of our future. And we have to remember a couple things as we study this particular passage. One, he is talking primarily to a Jewish audience. And to fully grasp the future that this context is talking about, you need to understand that whole of the teaching regarding God's future kingdom points to two aspects of what this kingdom will look like. There will be a temporal or a, or a, a time-bound aspect to the future kingdom, and then there's this eternal aspect to it. There's the essentially the millennium, and then there's the new heaven and new earth, right? Uh, keep in mind the order of events that are laid out in Scripture. The next thing on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. Then there will be the rise of the Antichrist and the breaking of the seven-year covenant that the Antichrist makes with the Jews in the tribulation. That's the three and a half, after three and a half years. Then there's the pouring out of God's wrath on the world. Of course, the church is gone at this point, but it judges the Gentiles and it purifies Israel. And then the return of Christ with the church to the earth to defeat the nations at the battle of Armageddon. And then at the end of that time, there's a thousand year reign called the millennium, uh, the millennial kingdom. Satan, it will be Satan and the Antichrist, the false prophet. They are bound for those thousand years. Right. But then there's a releasing of him. It's, it's revealed in Revelation 20 verses 7 through 10. 
And then there is a great white throne judgment where, where uh, then uh, those who are unbelieving, those that are defeated uh, in this battle, that, that after Satan is released, he's defeated, right? And there's a great white throne judgment and Satan and death and hell and the unbelieving are all thrown into the lake of fire. And then there's the eternal state, this coming of this new heaven and new earth, right? So, so that's kind of the order. And, and the metaphor here has been made that Isaiah sees this future, but he doesn't see him as specifically as what I just laid them out in the sense that in this particular passage, there are aspects of the millennium and then aspects of the eternal, of this new heaven and new earth that kind of get intermingled here, right? He can see both this metaphor of these mountains. He can see them both as peaks in the distance, but he doesn't necessarily know the distance between those two peaks, right? Um, we can see the peaks, but we don't see the valleys in between, right? And so one commentator put it this way, speaking of this temporal millennial kingdom and this eternal new heaven and new earth, he's, it, he says it this way, the prophet uses the eternal kingdom here as a reference point for both. Isaiah's prophecy does not make clear the chronological relationship between the kingdom's two aspects as his later prophecy. This is similar to the compression of Christ's first and second coming so that in places they are indistinguishable. So what he's saying is uh, the, the millennium and the, and, and the eternal state are kind of uh, compressed here. He's, he gives aspects to both. Essentially, in the list that I just said, he's he's combining. I said number six and number nine. That uh, on my list, the the millennial uh, reign and then the eternal state. Some of these details are true in the millennium. Some of them are only true in the eternal kingdom. Either way, when we focus, here's I give all that to you because I want I don't want you to get confused. The point of this passage is to give us hope. Either way, when we focus on this future that is described, it will bring us all kinds of hope. Why? Because of what will happen for us in this preferred future when we know Jesus Christ. Hope can be ours today when we see the results of God's future kingdom. And by living in light of these results that are described in Isaiah, again, 65, 17 through 24. When we know what our future will be, it will impact how we live now. And so we can have hope, again, by seeing these results. Now let's look at these results one at a time. Very simple. Result number one is joy. Joy. Look at verse 17. It says this. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered nor come into mine. But ye, but be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days. So, I'm sorry, I said it again. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred, uh, shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. In this text, in verses, um, in verses 17 through 20, we see this future kingdom and we see joy. Why is there so much joy? There's a lot of joy because he says he creates a new heaven and a new earth, right? In this future, there will be this new heaven and new earth. Our earth, although it is beautiful at times, has been cursed by sin. And God makes a new, a new earth here that's free from sin, pain, and death. And that's why there's so much joy. It says in verse 18, but be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I created Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. He's talking about glad and rejoicing in verse 18. Verse 19, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. <laughs> so you have all these words, glad, rejoicing, joying. There's some that are spoken about the people of Israel themselves. These some of them are talking about God. And, 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 and there's so much joy, it says that even by the end of 19, that in this future, the voice of weeping shall no more be heard in her, or talking about in Jerusalem, nor the voice of crying. There will be no more reason to weep or to cry. Why? The things that produced all of that, all of those kind of sorrows are gone. Verse 20 explains kind of why, 
why are they not crying anymore? Why is there so much joy? Well, it's in part. Verse 20 says, there shall be no more there that's an infant of days, or nor an old man that hath not filled his days, meaning people aren't prematurely dying. The child that dies at 100 years old, it, this, apparently there's a there's an elongation of life in this millennial kingdom where where a hundred year old person is still just very much a young person. And the one who dies at a hundred is dying prematurely, right? The verse is obviously true of only the, the millennial kingdom. In the eternal kingdom, there's going to be no more death. Even in the millennial kingdom, though, God will allow for a length of life and a severely declining infant mortality rate. So, so get this, imagine a world characterized by an abundance of joy with little to no hint of sorrow. Imagine a world where God dwells with his people, where he will wipe away all the tears from their eyes. Man, I can't wait for that. I can't, I'm so glad that that's where I'm going to end up in this, with this, etern in this eternity where there's no more death or dying or crying. It's gonna be amazing. Paul spoke of it this way. It, it, it was a real comfort to me this week when I read this. He says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. The intensity of the greatest sorrow that we feel down here is not worthy to be compared with the intensity of joy that we will experience in this incredible future God has for us. And so I want to tell you that today, no matter how difficult things are going for you right now, that the intensity of the difficulty that you're experiencing right now is nothing. It's like the penny on the sidewalk next to the Empire State Building. That is the joy and the glory that's going to be revealed in us when we get to heaven. It's, it's amazing. We can have hope because of this joy that's promised in the future. So the first result is joy. The second result is abundance, abundance. Look at verse 21. It says, and they shall build houses and inhabit them and they shall plant vineyards and eat of the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. God's future plan for us includes so much joy, but it also includes abundance. Now, meaningful work wasn't part of the curse. God instituted work before the curse, right? There's a lot of people that think, well, work, we, we're not going to work ever, you know, in heaven, there's going to be no work. I, I want to tell you that, that that isn't necessarily true. I think there's going to be meaningful work. The issue is not that there was work. That wasn't part of the curse. What was part of the curse was toil and work. God said in Genesis 3 to Adam, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring thee forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sword of thy face thou shalt eat the, thy bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was taken, for dust thou art. And unto dust shalt thou return. The issue wasn't work. He was put in the garden to dress and to keep the garden beforehand. The issue was the toil. That there would, there would be uh, cursed ground. That there would be thorns and thistles. And that it would be from the sweat of the brow that the work would happen. So in the millennial and eternal kingdom, work will continue. Because of the limits of sin in the millennial kingdom and the absence of, of sin in God's eternal kingdom, there will be a lack of corruption. Injustice will be a thing of the past. In the new kingdom, there will be work, but the work will be enjoyable, right? Work will bring about an abundance of things to enjoy because the efforts will be blessed by the Lord. In verse 23, that's what it says, right? It says, um, they shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of blood. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pa pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. This kind of reminds me of what God did in the garden where he said he blessed the ground and brought forth fruit out of the ground. 
Verse 24 even makes it sound like he wants to answer them as soon as they begin asking. It makes me think of a loving father who cannot wait to bless his kids with things that will be really good and enjoyable for them. Here's the point. In that day, in our incredible future, there will not be lack. There will not be a, a wanting or poverty. There will be an incredible abundance. We will have everything we need and we will enjoy God's blessings. But here's the key. We'll enjoy them in such a way that we don't worship them. It creates this desire to worship and serve and love our God even more. We'll be able to enjoy and use things and love and serve and worship God. The blessings of God will not be what we worship. It'll be what we enjoy. His blessing will cause us to love and enjoy him more. And so we can have hope today because this incredible future of abundance that God's planned for us. We have so much joy. We have so much abundance. And this is why Jesus told us to live for that future instead of this present. When he said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on the earth where moth and rust corrupts and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither rust, whether moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Man, put your put your in your joy or, or your hope in the temporary today, and you'll have a lack of joy. Put it in the future God has for you, man, you're gonna have all kinds of joy. Put all of your investment in this life, it's literally all gonna go away. Put it into eternity, you'll have a treasure that lasts. Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We can have hope because of this joy and abundance that's promised to us. Here's the last one, number three, peace, peace. See this in verse 25. It says this, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. The number one worry of the lamb is a predator like a wolf or a lion. <laughs> At least that's how it is now. It's so obvious that we should be scared of certain parts of the animal kingdom that it barely needs, needs to be taught to our kids. Wolves and lions are dangerous. Most of the animals in Australia will kill you. <laughs> I'm joking, kind of, but my, my point is in the future that, that the animals today, uh, because of the curse, there is this predation, this predatory sense for a lot of animals. But in the future that God has planned for us, there will be suspension of these kinds of worries. God will provide nourishment for these animals without the need for predation. Can you imagine a child walking their pet tiger down the road and no one thinks anything about it, right? We don't have to worry about those kinds of things. In this incredible future that God has for us, there will be no need to fear, right? Why? Because those kinds of things will be former things. John said it this way. I love this in, in, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 3 and 4. And it says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Get this, for the former things are passed away. Pain, sorrow, crying, death, those are former things. There's going to be a future in which those things are things we used to deal with and we we won't even have to worry about them anymore. God will be with us and we will have nothing to fear. The sorrows and dangers of this life will be former things. Former things. The worst that can happen to us is to send us to a place where we will experience these kinds of amazing realities. We can have hope in the future because of the joy that's promised to us in the future, the abundance, the peace, the not having to deal with these difficulties and dangers, 
We're going to be with God. He's going to be with us. He'll be our God. We'll be his people. And it'll be an amazing thing. So how does that make us live now? How shall we then live? Well, here's two responses. Two responses. The first response I want you to have tonight is the response that's really an answer to this question that's laid out for us in 2 Peter. 2 Peter, he says in verse 11, that seeing then that these things, all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for, for and hastening under the coming of the day of God, wherein heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Peter tells us here that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It says that in, in verse 10, I believe, right before that, that when the Lord comes, it'll be like a thief in the night. The thief does not like to come when they're expected, but they come when they're unexpected, right? A thief comes at night because he wants to be covert. He doesn't want to be seen by the neighbors. He also wants to come at night because he doesn't want the people at home to be awake and catching him. He comes when he's not expected. Now, this is not, this is how God comes, but he's not like the thief with these bad motives. Why? Because he's telling us right now that he's coming. He's saying, you're going to be tempted to not expect me. I'm going to come at a time where most people don't expect me, but I want my people to expect me. And that's the first response. We, we, the gnome as a as savior should expect him to come back. Peter reminds us that the heavens are on fire shall be dissolved, right? And to replace it, we look for the coming promises of God. We look for, as he says here, the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So we need to live a life of expectation, looking every day for God to come back. The second response is this response of endurance. Look at verse 14 of 2 Peter 3. Verse 14, the next verse. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, meaning you're looking for the day of the Lord, you're looking for this future, you're looking for Christ to come back. Since you're looking for such things, be diligent. Be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. He says, because you're looking for these things, because you're expecting God to come back, you're expecting this incredible future. I want you to endure. I want you to be proactive. I want you to work hard at. I want you to be diligent. In what? In the way that you live your life, so that when He comes, we would be found of Him in peace, without spot and blameless. You know, when I was a, a teenager, my mom and dad would used to go, maybe they'd run errands, maybe they'd go on a date. Sometimes they'd leave in the afternoon and be gone most of the evening. Sometimes it would just be for an hour or two. And often when they would go, they would tell us, hey, don't watch TV or don't watch TV until you do the chores or whatever it is. They'd have some list for us to do. And you know, like a typical teenager, we didn't always manage our time very well, right? And so when we expected that they would be back in 30 minutes or an hour, we would immediately go to that list and get it done. But sometimes we would get like a little bit lax and sometimes they've been gone for an hour or two. And so we would turn on the TV, we would do things and we wouldn't expect them to be back. And then we'd hear in inevitably the sound of the garage door starting to go up, right? And it's the fear that strikes you. Oh no, mom and dad are back. And, Man, I didn't do what I was supposed to. And, oh, and you're scrambling to get whatever you can get done on the list done, knowing that they would be back, right? Too often we would hear the sound of the garage door going up and not have the list done. But if we expected our parents to be back at any time, we would be faithful to get the list done. Now, I know that's a simple illustration, but here's the point. The principle is the same. If you knew Christ was going to come back today, that he would be back right now to rapture this you as part of the church to go to him. How would you live? I, I hope that you have that hope, that you would be convinced of this truth that one day Christ is coming back. 
But if you knew he was coming back today, who would you share the gospel with? Who would you apologize to and get right with? Who, who, would you, who would you write that letter to or make that phone call to? If Christ was coming back today, would you live the same way you did yesterday? If you knew that today was the day that he was coming back, would he find you faithful? What Peter says is, hey, if you know if you're expecting him to come, be diligent. Expect him to come and endure. Be diligent in looking for a life of holiness, blamelessness, and peace. Jesus could come back today. Are you ready for him? C.T. Studd said it this way. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say twas worth it all. Only one life, twill soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. I love the fact that Isaiah here gives us, after giving us a prophecy about Jesus' death, his sacrificial death in Isaiah 53, which we'll study in the coming days, that all came true in Jesus' first coming in stunning detail. If we could trust him to be right about Christ's first coming, I'm telling you, we can, we can trust him about what the Holy Spirit says through Isaiah about what's going to happen the second coming. And I want you to know today, you have so much hope. God's future for you is a future of joy. It's a future of abundance. And it's a future that's got so much peace. So how should you live? You should live a life of expectation, looking for Jesus to come back. And living a life of endurance, being diligent to be found faithful, to be found blameless, to be found holy, to be found at peace with him. God's got an incredible future find hope in that today. God, I love you so much. I thank you for your word. I pray that it would not return void as you promised it would not, but that it would do an incredible work in the lives of these people. And as they go out and be salt and light this week, you'd help them to live a life looking for your soon coming and living as salt and light in the world with a sense of urgency, doing what we can do today to make a difference for eternity. We love you. Thank you for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.